Hi guys, so I'm here today with Coach Raymond and Coach Emily from the Steak and Butter Gang. They've got a great community over there, so um, I suggest you guys go over and follow what they're doing over there. Um, the links will be in the show, no show notes below as well. Um, the reason why I wanted to bring them on today was to talk specifically about fat fasting, um, what the protocol is, what the benefits, all the things around that. So Raymond, would you like to start? Sure. Fat fasting is a great protocol to get us trained into uh, actual fasting. We really prefer the idea of uh, actual fasting than uh, the fat fasting, but there's some people that just cannot do it. And regardless of whether they've uh, tried several times of just, you know, doing a good priming and it doesn't seem to actually stick for them. So that's where fat fasting comes in. But, you know, we're talking about fasting. We're talking about uh, all the way down from the 16, 18, all the way through the skips, you know, so it depends on what level they get at. It is a training. And uh, so, you know, this is kind of like a training wheel. Now, honestly, to tell you the truth, if they keep at it and keep trying to fast and do a slow rise, their body will eventually adapt to it. But this fat fasting are for people also who has a lot of issues like uh, they, they can't stuff themselves, for example. So they can't properly prime. They can't eat un until totally satiated either. So they, that, that means that they have to eat till satisfaction because they had a stomach surgery or whatnot, which is fine. So fat fasting comes in for those guys too. Yeah, I mean, there are so many areas that this can improve somebody's health. Um, we've certainly been inspired. Raymond and I have always been high fat carnivores. We've always eaten, you know, 70, 30 or something like that. And in the past uh, six months plus, I've shifted to higher fat. I don't track my macros, but if I would look at it, it's about the 80, 20 spot as I've gone higher and higher in fat. Um, so there's just a lot of reasons to take this fat fasting approach, I actually think of it as fat feasting or as being fat fueled instead, because we're not putting any limit on how much fat you can eat. And we tend to talk about it in terms of butter to one to two sticks of butter a day. I know last time we talked, Jonathan, that you'd been playing with that. And you told me how many sticks you and your girlfriend had bought you know, over the last month. It was tremendous last little bit. So, so many healing properties that can happen when we add that animal fat. It's such a beautiful energy source. It affects how our metabolism changes. It can be wonderful mentally for folks that have a, get a lot of benefit from pumping up the ketones, being a higher ketosis for their mental state. Not that it needs to be measured, but there's a lot of um, uh, mental benefits that can come from fat fasting as well. Yeah, brilliant. I mean, I've not tried it yet. Um, I don't think it'd be that useful for me because when I do go for periods of time when I, you know, don't eat. I'm quite fat adapted. I can go for quite a while. Um, I can drop my body fat quite well and I can raise the body fat quite well. It's, you know, it's quite, um, it, it seems to be quite a cause and effect. You know, if you, the more you eat generally, the, the fatter you'll get. Um, to explain, I don't think it's, that's what I mean. That's why I'm mm. saying that this is not for everybody. Mm. This is mainly for the people who have hard time getting into it. Yeah. It's, it's definitely got its, um, necessary approaches. Um, who may or may not use it, you know, yeah, I completely agree with that. Um, right. So what are, the, what are the possible drawbacks? If someone starts fat fasting, so they do, they're three days in, they think, oh, I want to get to the week, you know, everyone wants to do seven days or whatever it is. What would happen at perhaps the seventh day or around that sort of period of time? Well, the biggest drawback to fat fasting is the nausea. So if they overdo it, because, you know, we're allowing unlimited and some people don't get the feel right away, Shortly after, they'll get a, a nausea feeling and also a food, or, uh, what we call fat aversion, so uh, or meat aversion, and they just don't want any meat, they don't want anything else. And really, unfortunately, during that time, we actually have to be a little more careful because uh, then you'll actually want carbohydrates because that's the only thing that seem like can settle very well. So especially early on, I want to tell people that they need to be careful with that. Don't you know, don't pound the fats just to quell hunger. <laughs> fats and proteins are important for that. So you can't just do one or without the other at that point if you're not expecting that. So it's a small amount of fat. It's literally fat fasting. 
Yeah. And that's, we don't really recommend going over the 72 hour point at all. And so if someone is trying to go into four days, five days, I don't think they would feel good. A lot of our practices and, uh, you know, we, we can understand some of the metabolism behind why people feel certain ways if they're trying this protocol or that protocol. Um, but we really, uh, tie into not feeling well, if you're not feeling good or you're having specific hungers, or you're even having a hunger or craving, I think on carnivore, your body gets so sensitive that it can kind of guide the way for you and tell you which macro you need more of as you're going along. Obviously people that are doing have your lifestyle that probably would want more protein. <laughs> so I, that's a really important point too, is just if they're, they're not feeling good. And so the way that we do it is that it's very gradual and it's uh, we introduce it a little bit at a time, take a rest, a little bit of time, take a rest. And so we're not going to take any of our protocols, water fasting, fat fasting, and just have somebody slam right into it. The fat fasting to me is a really nice transition uh, to get the metabolism in a better spot so that it can handle uh, more challenge. That's the interesting thing. You know, this from bodybuilding, you have to have challenge for uh, the body to respond. And it's like the hermetic stress, right? And so these are other versions of that. We're trying to get the foundation really solid, get everything really set until they want to exercise, until they want to water fast. We're trying to like get the metabolism to this spot that it actually, the body's actually craving the next um, better step for them. Yeah, brilliant. I'm glad you explained all that because it is um, very nuanced and to different degrees, different capacities of different people. Um you can definitely do it wrong. Yeah. Yeah. I, I might try it one day or just see what happens, but you know, I'll leave, I'll leave that for another time. But um yeah, so you got the fat fasting. So you got the average person eating, say, I don't know, 150 grams of protein, 150 grams of fat initially prior to any fasting. What would happen with that fat macro when they are fasting? Would it raise or stay the same or lower? um we're not really big on the measurement because you know it's a little different day by day some people do want a little bit more fat and some people prefer a little more protein but on a fat fasting day we actually like fats only for example if they're going to do rolls there may be like about 30 grams of protein throughout the day so 10 grams per meal kind of thing if, if you're considering three meals with the fat uh being unlimited but this is a by feel kind of way. So, but it depends. And when I say rolls, rolls of fasting, meaning like uh, you're you're fasting one day, like the whole day, and then uh, the next day you you eat regular, and then you repeat. Uh, so that's the only time that I'd recommend any type of protein. But otherwise than that, eat regular. You know, find out what your body wants at that time. Whether it's fat, whether it's more protein. There are some days, I mean, it just depends, right? Depends if the body needs building, protein is for building, right? Fats for energy. So if it needs more building that time, I, for me, my body tells me that. If it needs more energy, my body will tell me that also. Yeah, absolutely. And I love um, when you're, when you, the, the fat is so nutritional too. And so it just kind of depends on where they're coming from. So many carnivores, when they start, once we let them know they can eat as much as they want, they can eat as much butter as they want, their body just calls for it. And so there's a lot of, I feel like background um, malnutrition that they're trying to make up for. And so how much they want, we do get uh, folks that are scared by how much butter they want to eat. And we say, no, don't be scared. You, you, you just go, you can just nourish your body. It's totally fine. So there isn't really an upper limit up, up to the issue of nausea and indigestion. That's where, you know, that happens once they hit those issues and we're like, okay, that was too much. So you don't want to, you want to go slow. That's what I'm trying to say. You want to kind of add slow if possible, but if you just have this voracious hunger and you want to put away, you know, a lot of butter, we're taking that as a sign that the body needs the healing from that. That's kind I mean, it's going to help so much and the body, the, the hormones and um, all the cofactors, the wonderful things that fat does, the lowering stress. That's another huge um, uh, advantage to fat fasting is, you know, we're learning about this cortisol fat connection and the fat just calms that high cortisol it can get low cortisol or, or high cortisol. It's like the lubricant that keeps, keeps, keeps it evened out instead of having these big highs and these big lows. So if someone's coming from 
super high stress, then it's possible that, that they'll want more butter and more fat to get that system calmed down. Yeah, I've had the same experiences. So, I mean, I've tried, um, just speaking on fat as a macronutrient alone, I've tried the 80-20 approach. Um, granted, my 80-20 is high protein anyway. But um, yeah, I tried that and I noticed some body fat gain, some, not, I didn't get fat, but some. And my my mood was a lot better. My joints felt mm-hmm. better and I was much calmer. I mean, I was pretty calm anyway because I don't... I, I tend not to worry about anything ever at any point, but it was almost worrying about how little I was worrying about things. It felt so chilled out. So um, there's definitely an element there to be seen for um, the high fat intakes. Definitely. I think so too. And we see people get into what I call the cruise zone. And so this is another sign of becoming fat adapted where appetite comes way down and they're just not hungry. And they're like, well, do I still need to cram more fat in? And no, (laughs) if your body's in neutral and you've gotten that satiety and you're fasting for this very specific purpose, that's fine. You don't need, we're not saying cram more in, cram more in, you're free to, but you don't have to, there's not any like set amount that you have to get in. Yeah. Now, I mean, I know you're, you you like counting and all that kind of stuff. So I'm kind of curious. I don't know how this would help with bodybuilding, but it probably could be done in a smart way, but there would have to be counting. There's no way around it. Mm. Yeah. 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 I I don't love people doing this uh, long-term without some other kind of signaling towards muscle gains personally. So I, I don't love the idea of people just doing fat fasting with no movement at all. Uh, I, you know, right. my understanding, right. <laughs> my understanding idea. is that, that, um, what you're doing when you're challenging your muscles and the signals that your body gets to lay down that muscle, Jonathan, you're an expert in that more than I am, but even, you know, potentially as much as the nutrients important is your body getting the signal to do it. And so I think if people are going to be doing a fat fasting protocol, I really prefer that they be doing something with their body. That's, that's movement. That's kind of giving that other signal as well to, you know, cause it's muscle protective. We always have to be muscle protective. And so that's the other a component that we're looking at is like, we don't want to get that part of the picture in trouble. Yeah, I, I love I love that advice and the way you explain things, um, how you should do things in particular circumstances, how you shouldn't do some things in other circumstances. Um, you know, you've got a community over there at the Steak and Butter Gang that uh, imagine from guessing a lot of them aren't very well or have poor health in some cases, yes. um, some worse than others. Yes. So, you know, like Coach Emily and Coach Raymond would come on here and talk about fat fasting, you know, different intakes. You know, a lot of people jump on the bandwagon because they're so desperate. But I'm so glad you went over all these things, how it's going to be a pro or a con and all those different things. Um, so I have another question as well about the fat sources. So what would you guys take in? Cream, butter, tallow, what's on your plate? Great question. For me, I, I tallow is is the way I like. You know, it, wh- whether it's New York strip or the ribeyes, you get it untrimmed. So I have quite a nice little fat source, and that's what I use. And also cheese, but cheese is probably the worst one you can do if uh, you know you're trying to lose weight. But that's just my thing, right? Uh, again, so you know, unlike unlike most people, uh, I, I'm not in it for body composition. So you know, I was in this for literally just healing. The body composition just came about as a surprise. So, but, you know, I had, I was working out fasting and doing carnivore and that seemed to be a very nice trifecta that ended up in a positive light for me. Yeah. I mean, I think that when you're coming to fat sources, I'm glad you brought up the, uh, the nemesis of the carnivore for a lot of people is heavy whipped cream. (laughs) Heavy cream as it's called in lots of places. And so the, the tradition, the history of fat fasting goes way back to Dr. Atkins, right? And so what did you, when you did fat fasting with Atkins, it was macadamia nuts and cream cheese or just pure cream cheese. So uh, Raymond has really uh, kept me in my place about this. And I'm really glad as much as I hated it. He said, we're not doing this with dairy. We're not doing it. <laughs> now there is one exception. Butter. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> the exception Thank is you. butter. Right. Yeah. Because Butter for most people is not going to cause an issue. And if it does, then there's ghee. So best way to go with this is uh, tallow, suet, any animal fat. You can use lard and pork fat um, and uh, butter and ghee. But we're actually steering clear of things that are inflammatory because 
we're looking at this as a healing protocol. If you look at dairy, it's too inflammatory. It's insulogenic for it's perfect for certain reasons, but we're doing this fat fasting for as a healing protocol. And so we don't want to mix it up with other components that are going to cause um, more problems. So sadly for me, I've made up a bunch of recipes for our fat fasting program. I had to go through and, you know, take out the heavy whipped cream because <laughs> I got, I got pretty excited with creating all these things out of eggs, right? So when egg yolks specifically, so we can put together some really nice things from egg yolks and butter or egg yolks and tallow, but we're definitely steering away from any processed dairy for the purpose of fat fasting. There's a place for that in the carnivore diet, of course, not for our fat fasting days. Yeah. For Emily's recipes, um, look on Instagram on her channel. Um, she's got pretty interesting stuff. I mean, I looked at those egg yolks you put, put up, I think it was today, and I was like, I could do some of that. <laughs> They're just like so bright and creamy and like, you know, for someone that, um, oh. you know, for someone that used to be addicted to carbs, then to be addicted to fat, like enjoy fatty foods. It's so bizarre. Um, and yeah, I mean, the, the dairy thing, um, what I see from most people is that dairy is quite addictive, um, you know, so you're going to end up wanting more of it um the other thing is it can be inflammatory to some people i mean there is a level of intolerance that people se seem to have to dairy itself um either the lactose or the protein component um so there's some sort of applications for it in bodybuilding um in that you know often dairy cheese has a lot of leucine cottage cheese milk whatever so that's good for growing muscles but um Yes. In this sort of approach, we're refocusing really on lowering the insulin and upping the glucagon. So we're going to get that sort of signaling. So we're going to signal um, PPAR, get everything fat adapted and accelerate that healing process. So healing isn't always a case of patching things up. Sometimes it's take the case of removing things, taking the inflammatory problems out of your diet, um, healing the gut wall. And I think, yeah, there does seem to be some decent approach to this sort of methodology. Yeah. Yeah, we're excited. So we, uh, we're definitely, we've got a lot of feedback coming in already. I don't know if you saw the testimony in the gang today, coach, but we've got some folks that are, you know, showing lots of nice early signs of fat adaptation. Now that's the, the, how long does that take? How were they in the journey before this? It's like a boost. It's like a, like a super boost to the fat metabolism is how I think of it. So, um, yeah, we're excited to be experiencing it together and be playing around with it. And I, I love making recipes. So I'm always making recipes for the process as well. Yeah. See the big thing about uh, our group that we handle is, I mean, the concept is to try to keep you staying carnivore. That's the most concept, right? The rest, you kind of have to figure out, you know, we, we've got sometimes 200 people on the zoom, which is quite a bit. Right. So obviously this is not a, I, there's a lot of statements that I can make that'll sound blanketed, but it's, it's not, you know, everybody is very unique. Of course, that's why us coaches are here, you know, coaches like you and all that. And it depends also on your goal. Somebody comes with, with, to me for an exercise goal, I'm going to be like, no, that's, that's Jonathan's job. That's not my job. My job is to just get you carnivore and that's it. You know, because carnivore, if you're really, first, you have to believe that carnivore is going to be good for you and that it is the proper human diet. I've already believed that. So therefore I set my way there. And then the West, you just have to figure out how to work this new body, right? And you need to find the proper experts to tune that in. But the most expert that you don't want to ignore is yourself because that's who tells you and gives you the proper feedback. And that's what we try to teach in the community. Yeah, I like that. Um, what I say to most of my clients is whenever they check in, consult with me, whatever it is, I ask them all these questions and it seems a bit random, but it's like, what's your sleep like? What's your digestion like? So if you ask someone how they are, they'll just say, yeah, I'm all right. You know, you've got to really focus right. in on all these different things. So yes. you as a coach and yourself as well, Emily, you you know in yourself what your body's doing at one given time. Um, so when you're trying to help other people, you have to identify what they're going through so you have to get the right questions across so um exactly. there's definitely not blanket questions to be um to be answered in a certain way you know there's no sort of one size fits all so I, I love that um about you guys is really good yeah yeah this is why some some people will tell you oh my god priming sounds like such a bad idea but when you actually hear the details of it and then you get the idea or fasting 
No, oh, that's such a bad idea. I can't see people just eating every other day for a week. That's going to kill them, right? Obviously, sounds like a bad idea, right? But if I tell you and explain it to you, then you're like, wait a minute, my body can do that? My body is able to do this? Well, then that's a whole different talk, right? It's kind of like gaining muscle. I mean, you know, if I told you work out hard, you know, daily, you know, and 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 I'm not sure how the workout formula works, but uh, then you'll make gains. But some people won't, right? If you do it wrong, um, people will think that's a bad idea. So it's the same concept, right? All of this is a training, a training to learn yourself. And of course, it's no difference from the bench to the food you're eating. We got to learn ourselves. It's the only way. That's so good. I love the the parallels between uh, training and fasting. They are very much related, yeah. very much so that if you, uh, I'm talking about water fasting right now, but this would apply to fat <laughs> fasting. If you go too hard, too fast, you're going to burn out and you're never going to want to fast again. And so this is actually a, like, it's a transition step. So it, it can be a transition step to get you to water fasting. It can also be a transition rest to have a rest from water fasting. So that's another reason that we create created this for our gang was to have, you know, another modality to use with this, but it's very much designed in a progressive manner. And that's what I love about it. And so, yeah, we, 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 we're not muscle people, Jonathan, but we compare it. People understand the muscle process. And so we compare fasting to that journey quite a bit, actually. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I can see how there's um, parallels between the two. I mean, are you, are you advising people to exercise intensively when doing this sort of thing? Or is it that you just you know, you just go for a walk and just chill out. On priming, no. Priming is a, and fat fasting priming, no. On uh, when they get to their two mads, we're like, hey, that's open season. You should be able to, and, and that's the thing. If you're not able to do a workout properly while you're in a fasted state, whether it's a fat fasting state or a fasted state, you're just not ready for that fast. It's too much for you. And that's how you gauge how well it is. I did mine with exercise. And that's how I gauged how much of a fast I needed or not, you know, or how much I needed to recoup or not, because my, believe it or not, my workout was the marker. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. I found throughout my fasting, I'm mostly water fasting is what I'm speaking to right now is that if it was kind of a, an aerobic or a hit type of thing, I love that fasted. If it was more on the bodybuilding thing, I actually prefer that fed. So it just, right. I agree with that. Is that how it was with you too, for Katrina? Yeah. 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 If I, if I, if I went, wanted to lift heavy, that's a different story. I prefer going into it fed, mm -hmm. but either way that's fed like within, I don't know, about uh, three hours, three hours before the workout or two hours before the workout. But, uh, uh, really and honestly, if I'm doing like cardio or anything like that, I that's how I test how well my fat adaptation is because I I believe fat adaptations is different levels. So there there's fat adaptation where you can go without food for a long period of time. There's fat adaptation that if you're on a high level intensity, you still can go without food for a long, long time. So there's several levels of high adaptation. Mm. Uh, fat adaptation. So, uh, and a lot of people just say, oh no, it's just one thing. No, it's a lot more than that. It's kind of scalable. And that's what we do. We practice and flirt with almost breaking ourselves at every point and training with that. Well, just like exercise, right? And not what we do, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I've got a few more questions. Um, so this is something that I've tried. Um, and I got some other people to do it themselves. Um, you know, a lot of people have trouble with sleep. Um, for me as a bodybuilder, my main focus is always on recovery. Um, that does seem to yes. be, as I say, in literally nearly every interview I do with someone, that is the bottleneck of an elite athlete's training program. Um, I found that having fat before bed. So when I say fat, I mean having literally a tablespoon of butter, whatever, um, or make these like protein butter bite things. Um, there's a recipe on my channel anyway, somewhere. Um, but yeah, I make those and have that before bed. Delicious. I get more energy in and it sits nicely. Then I go to sleep and I'm much calmer and I have no sort of raciness before bed. So have you guys tried anything like that at all? Absolutely. Very much. We actually, uh, yeah, commented on yeah. a lot of people who have sleep problems, especially uh, with fasting too. 
No, it's a great thing to do. Yeah. Just to plan that right in. In fact, we definitely have had folks that just, you know, keep it on the nightstand if for waking up in the middle of the night, if they're kind of having an odd, odd time and they get up, it can help them get back down and get everything settled down. So I think that's a fantastic trick. If people are struggling with sleep, that's actually one of the first things that we'll recommend is some butter and some salt before they're going to bed. That will oftentimes uh, take the edge off and help, help them get a lot better rest. Aren't you amazed how little it takes? Mm. To me, that's the first part that I've noticed. It takes so little. And you're like, how does so little fat make such a difference? Yeah. I mean, I've got um, a grandmother, um, my nanny. She's 91 years old the other day and she's been having troubles with sleep. And I've recommended her, you know, have a some butter before bed. Um, granted, she isn't a carnivore. Um, she doesn't, you know, her the way she's been brought up as, you know, toast, scones and, you know, British sort of foods. Um, but she'll do some toast before bed now, some butter in it. I'm hoping that'll help her. Um, you know, so there's, there's applications even if you aren't a convoy. So I think that's that's a good good idea as well. Yeah, I do agree. I think having having lots of animal fats available in the diet is going to help a lot of situations. Yeah. So um, I've got another question. Um, why do you think heavy cream is insulinogenic? <laughs> Well, I'll go to my, I'll go to my answer that I've learned from, from coach Steven, Steven. but uh, it's something, yeah, yeah, yeah. He says that it's the odd chain fatty acids. I don't know if you've heard him talk about that, that there's kind of a, that kind of splits off. And so there's something that it does with the biochemistry where it is insulogenic and raises the, the raises your blood sugar. Well, whether your glucose goes up or not, that the insulin goes up. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. The way I like to see it is a little bit different, especially on heavy cream. So most heavy cream here in the United States, it might be different over there, but uh, most heavy cream are ultra pasteurized. So we're talking a heavy denatured, pretty much sugar water, as far as I'm concerned at that point, you know, uh, so that's, that's what's, and not, and the fats added back afterwards, right? But the fats are also homogenized, you know, to make it the texture, so that kind of uh it's it's partly the denaturing process that makes it most uh most an issue but now a little splash is fine but if you're drinking that stuff that can definitely be an issue and a, a little splash for some people so you know they use it just to just to get their coffee to be more um able to drink it so for that it, it's fine but still for some people that puts on weight too even that little bit yeah. Yeah. It's so different from butter. It behaves so differently from butter. And so I think of all dairy except for butter for me, uh, and the butter seems to be more of a, uh, sensitivity, like you said, like the lactose, the casein, like that. And that for surely there's some folks that butter doesn't work for, but the rest of the dairy family, every single one of them, uh, to me, there's something about it that is based on growth. And to me, it goes back to what's dairy for to make baby mammals grow and to make them right. fat. And that's, you know, if you think about what this is, so it just makes sense to me that like, okay, this makes a lot of sense to make a little mammal fat and <laughs> to, to, you know, get this going. And so I think that for some of us, uh, you know, in our, even older that it's, it could have that same effect. And there's so many anecdotals uh, especially we can know that in the carnivore community because we don't eat that many different foods. And so if you have a, you know, experience of different folks that are like the carnivores that gain weight with dairy versus that don't, it's kind of interesting. We have a, a special population that we can explore about that experience too. And I, I know that I'm one, it's, it's a growth ingredient for me. Let me just put it that way. But that's not such a bad thing. You know, there are yeah. people like, you know, um, Dr. Kevin Stock, you know, he's, he's one of those kind of lean people who who no matter what he does, it's probably hard for him to get on weight. Well, then, you know, uh, dairy is excellent for those type of people as long as he can tolerate mm. it. So sometimes gaining weight is a, a good thing. There's a lot of people out there that want to gain weight. Um, Saladino is one of the types, actually, believe it or not, that probably would never get fat. So he's always easily, easily on the leaner side, you know. So you can look at it and use that as your strategy instead of carbs, Although it does have a certain amount of carbs in there, but you could use that for your growth process. 
I agree completely. And some people will use dairy strategically before bed, a different process than what we're talking about right. butter. Okay, butter is coming from the calming perspective, from the calming of the cortisol. So the, 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 if people use a little bit of cheese right before they go to bed, it's because of the rise and the fall, right? So what do we see that with? So it has carbs in it. So we're going to get that a different response with that, with the blood sugar and the insulin. So that is uh, something that I've noticed as well. And then also, I'm sure you're aware of this, Jonathan, a lot of carnivore athletes will use it as part of their, if they feel that they need carbs carbs for a workout, then cheese can come in the picture for that or dairy can come in the picture for that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I love, I love the idea that um, the dairy is more anabolic and the, the the butter being more, not catabolic, but more calming. So it's still, I agree completely. Yeah. 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 So I've got um, one more question before we wrap this up, guys. So um, quite a few people have been messaging me and they've said, how do these two people stay so young and look so young? And you know, Him I and me? Be, both these of two you two, Emily really? and Raymond. Oh my god! Well, thank uh, you, everybody. I yeah, love that I know, question. I, I I actually think I look well. I I don't know what a fifty year old look like. At first, I really look my age, so that's the biggest thing. But um, so. Here's the thing. I think carnivore puts you at the age you're supposed to look like. I was not meant to look this old. You know, uh, I was not meant to age this quickly. And you could tell I have a little bit of gray coming in. But before it was it was crawling up all up here. So all this is black now. And then there's still a little layer of my beard and a little bit on my um, um, this area. So yeah. it. I just I I don't know what it what carnivore does, but th there's obviously explanation about the senescent cells that the the carnivore diet makes it where the body's strong enough to actually kill off the improper cells, kind of like a tumor or cancer, right? So usually the problem about those cells growing in your body is because that your body is not able to send a kill switch to these cells. Well, if you get it strong enough and you proper getting proper nutrients, well, that's what it does. It is able to recycle its product. When it's unable to do that, well, then guess what? You start getting tons of senescent cells and eventually cancerous cells. And then the body's like, I don't know how to kill any of this. I'm just getting more and more and more. I don't know what to do, you know? And then, and then well, old age. That's amazing. I'm I'm just still beaming that anybody would say that. <laughs> so I'm 51. And I think a lot of what's happening uh, with me and Raymond too, is that we I'm five years into the fasting journey, the fasting yes. lifestyle. And I'm talking about water fasting with this. And so I think that there's a lot of things that we can do to stimulate autophagy, but we know that fasting is a really powerful tool for, for sure. autophagy and for the recycling. And so as the cells break down, how I think of it is they're scavenging and looking, uh, looking for other materials they are breaking down materials. And so I feel like the skin gets recycled, the proteins get recycled, like all of that builds into new. I feel like it goes and it gobbles up kind of the old dying spots. So I would attribute, attribute uh, any youthful appearance that I would have as a 51 year old to autophagy and uh, just that being super enhanced through water fasting, because I'm always going to be a faster. Um, I, I actually think that clean fasting is the way to go. Um, but I think that fat fasting is wonderful for therapeutic uses. And so I'm thrilled that, that we can teach that as well. Yeah. So I, I love how Emily said that about the fasting. It's true, you know, because I was a carnivore plus faster, but you know, I, I want to preface this. Although carnivore has all of this, to me, you have to do, to me, I could have never done fasting on a carb life. Okay. At all. Cause I was hungry all the time. Okay. Carnivore allowed me to do fasting. I know it was a little different. I think uh, Emily was doing low carb for a little while there on fasting. So she was able to do it, but God, that must've taken so much willpower. Um, I think, I think if you can do it where it's just, you know, it's just almost like uh, just a non-event, then it's the better way to go. I love it. I feel like carnivore is so powerfully nourishing. We get so much nutrition, even from like a small amount of food, whether you're a big volume eater, or whether you're, you know, the, just the, the amount of usable, absorbable, um, nutrition is so intense that it, I feel like it helps your body to nourish really well. And then to go into this neutral state where you can go and you're fine just to go about your life without food for 
periods of time and the body adjusts really well to that. Yeah. You guys seem legit because um, a lot of people don't know about some of the things you just spoke about. Oh. I'm actually quite impressed. Um, like the senescence. I mean, I've, I thought just very few people in the industry knew about that sort of thing. Um, I have interest, Roman. What did you learn about all that? Oh, well, I got into, uh, I got into dry, dry fasting for a little while. So they're big about the senescent cell killing off the senescent cells. But you know, the problem about all of the fasting groups and the, 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 uh, dry fasting or water fasting is nobody ever talks about the proper eating. Sure. You can take out all the junk by, uh, fasting and allowing yourself to take out all the junk, but part of it you got to replenish properly too you know so but yeah um it, it's it's a fascinating uh fascinating read if uh, you want to read into senescent cells that's just zombie cells cells that just take up space and uh, and uh yeah, excrete waste and is really useless to the body uh and the problem is is that the body doesn't know how to kill it off well we can dry fast it of course if you're not able to do it then it's you're not going to be able to do that. But if you eat properly, I noticed that later on, the more I, the more I became carnivore, the less I wanted to drink or eat. So it just, uh, it was just an automatic process for me. It's like, it just pretty much went that way. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool stuff. I mean, I, I, I learned about it from Harry's partners. So I don't know if you know him, but um, he's got excellent yes. insights. He's, for me, he's probably the go-to person other than perhaps Bart K. If I didn't know something, I mean, I don't know everything at all. There's a lot of things I need to learn, but you know, those two guys and yourself seem to be pretty switched on. And I love that. So that's, that's probably why I brought you both on today. Cause I knew you'd have some really good insights and you'd be able to explain things so well. So I appreciate both of your time. Thank, Thank you, you so much, much for having us again. Yeah. It was awesome being on here.